Well, good morning. Good to be together and welcome to those of you online. The rugby players must be happy after last night. Almost didn't do it, but we did. So that was kind of fun. It was nice to have a, <clears throat> a break in the day to watch a bit of sport. And I'm sure you've been watching the Olympics as I have in snatches. And uh, wonderful to see all the nations coming together and uh, just being aware of what's happening around the world uh, in the world of sport and uh, to see some of the amazing people that came together uh, in Tokyo. The absence of a crowd, of course, was disappointing. Uh, normally that adds so much, but... It certainly seems that the athletes are able to function optimally even though there wasn't a crowd. So that was, that was quite amazing to me. So uh, it's good to be able to look out of our bubbles at what's happening in the world, not only the tough things but also the fun things that are going on. Coming this morning to a new series, a seven-part seven series, I've called it seven words, key words of the Christian life. And when you think about it, every discipline has its own vocabulary. Uh, computer science has its own vocabulary, uh, most of which I don't understand. But I hear computer geeks talking together and they're throwing around these terms that they understand. I mean, engineers have their own vocabulary. All of us have learned a whole new vocabulary because of the COVID pandemic. We use words we never used before, but we understand each other. And uh, we have a COVID vocabulary. And of course, uh, every sport has its own particular vocabulary. I, I'm not a cyclist. Um, I have never been a cyclist. And I don't really understand how certain uh, aspects of professional cycling work. But this, this year, I found myself watching more of the Tour de France than I'd ever done before. Uh, first of all, because I love, the, I love the French countryside and the beauty and the, the roads and the rivers and the mountains and the castles and all of those. It was like, sort of like getting a free tour of France. And, uh, but in the process, I started picking up vocabulary and began to figure out some of these terms. Close to each other. Get the feel of what's going on and you learn terminology that is important to understanding cycling. And one could say that about all the Olympic sports, each of those sports has their own vocabulary. And as I was flicking through the channels, there are lots of sports that I just would flick through. I'm not interested in watching them. I'm not interested in learning their vocabulary. Um, you know, I just sort of stick to the ones I know and the ones that interest me. But when you think about it, the Christian life is no different. When you become a Christian and you start studying the Bible, you start coming across a whole lot of new words. Words that are vital to understanding what happened to you when you became a Christian. Words that are vital to understanding who you are as a Christian, what you are to believe as a Christian, what you are to do as a Christian, what you can expect God to do for you now that you're one of his children, there's a whole new vocabulary. You might call it the technical vocabulary of the Christian life. And uh, so I've chosen seven of those key words to unpack over, over the next weeks. They're not all the key words. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. J.R. Packer, that wonderful <clears throat> evangelical Anglican theologian, has written a little book called 18 Words. And the subtitle is 
the most important words you will ever know. And there are 18 of them. And we're just going to dip into seven of them. We'll pop up the slide with the seven words that we're going to be looking at. There they are. We're going to start with calling. Look at that this morning. And then conversion. Then regeneration. Justification. Adoption. Sanctification and glorification. As I said, there could be more, and there are more, but those are the ones we're going to focus on. Now, you might be sitting here thinking, well, we're sitting at home thinking, why? Now, why on earth do I need to know those terms? Why do I need to spend time trying to understand them? These are big jawbreaker words. One sentence from Don Carson may help us with this. He said, these elements, these words, these words and more, as I said, our packer has 18, these words and more belong together. And all who are truly saved ultimately experience all of them. Let me run that by again. These words and more belong together and all who are truly saved ultimately experience all of them. I think that should tell us why it is important that we know what these words mean. Now these are, these are big words and uh, because of that we're tempted to we're tempted to ignore them, uh, but they're important words, really important words that we need to understand. And uh, some of them are difficult to understand, and I'm going to, I'm going to warn you up front that uh, in this series you're going you're gonna to need to think. Uh, but that's not a bad thing. Uh, we're c- uh, commanded by Jesus to love the Lord with our minds, And so part of loving the Lord with our minds is trying to understand what he has has said to us. But more than that, there's there's a deep spiritual satisfaction that comes from really understanding these words and how they apply to your life and uh, to the lives of those around you. Um, before coming back to South Africa to, to Rosebank, we pastored uh, Central Baptist Church in the city of Victoria on Vancouver Island. Vancouver Island is a big island just off the coast, off the west coast of, of Canada. And uh, the, it's, it's a, Victoria is, must be one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And in the summer, the cruise ships, these huge floating hotels would come into Victoria and they would uh, vomit out all their occupants onto our streets, and they would spend their money, and uh, then they would all go back onto the cruise ship, and uh, then the cruise ships would head on up to to Alaska uh, through the inside passage and thread their way through the islands right up to those quaint little towns on the coast of Alaska. And uh, Irene and I always looked at those cruise ships with envy, uh, never dreaming that we'd ever get to go on one. Anyway, on our first trip back to Canada, about four years after uh, leaving to come back to South Africa, we were able to get a really good deal. It was quite a cheap deal and because we, were on the, we got a cabin on the inside of the ship, so we didn't even have a porthole to look out, but it was the cheapest one we could get. And, uh, and we did an Alaska cruise. Now, imagine, imagine, and you won't be able to imagine this because you know we're not that stupid. But imagine that we had just stayed in our cabin. Even if we had had a porthole, a cabin with a porthole, imagine if we had just got on the ship, stayed in our cabin, and it would have taken us all the way up to Alaska. We could have looked out of the little porthole in our cabin and we could have seen the sea 
Occasionally there'd be another ship, occasionally there'd be a dolphin, um, you know, and maybe under, uh, under the bed, in our, under the bunk in our cabin, we would have a suitcase full of our favorite biscuits. And so we would stay in our cabin and we would eat our biscuits and we would look out of the porthole and we would say sweet nothings to one another and there would just be a wonderful cruise. Duh. Imagine how stupid that would be. I mean, we would, as soon as we got up in the morning, we'd go out of the cabin and we had the whole cruise ship to enjoy and we would explore it from stem to stern or from stern bow to stern or whatever and there were multiple multiple floors and activities sporting activities recreational activities intellectual activities and food 24 hours if you felt like fish and chips at three o'clock in the morning you could get fish and chips at three o'clock in the morning i mean it was absolutely incredible and so we spent the whole time out exploring and enjoying and looking out at the glaciers as we went up through the inside passage to Alaska. Look, getting off and going to those quaint little towns and exploring all the curio shops and stuff. It was an incredible experience. And we just drank it in. I'm sure we didn't drink it into the full. We didn't. But it was, it was rich. But imagine if we had just stayed in our cabin and eaten our biscuits. We would have got up to Alaska and we would have got back. But, blah. Now, the truth is, some Christians live their lives in the cabin. Now, you've come to Christ, you're on the ship, in God's family, you look out of the porthole, nothing has changed in your Christian life for years. Same old, same old, you don't learn anymore, you don't grow don't experience what God has for you, you don't enjoy your salvation, you don't share it with anybody else, but you're on the ship, and you're on the way to heaven, and you're looking out the porthole, it's lovely, you're eating your biscuits. Now in this series, I want to take us out of the cabin. I want us to enjoy. I want us to explore the riches of Scripture that are ours. I mean, Irene and I had paid for that ticket so we could enjoy the whole experience. And God wants you and me to enjoy the whole experience of being a Christian. Right from day one until we get to heaven and then forever. So that's why we're doing this. So that we can get out of the cabin and explore and enjoy and worship and just love it. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. Now, I'd like you to turn in the Word of God to a familiar passage. Take your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to start in probably one of the best known verses in the New Testament, Romans 8, 28. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters." And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Now in verse 28, Paul says that those who love him are those who have been called according to his purpose. And in verses 29 and 30, he points to a definite order in which these blessings come to us. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also 
glorified. This is what this verse has been called the chain of salvation, the links in the chain of salvation. And uh, I think it was that wonderful Anglican bishop, uh, Handley Mole, who commented that all the links in this chain of salvation are forged by God. None of them is our doing. They're all forged by God. They're made by him. And in this chain of salvation, calling comes after foreknowing and predestining, which happen in eternity past. Calling, justification happen in time, and glorification happens in the future, even though it is spoken of here as in the past tense, because it's already a done deal, even though it lies in the future. And so I want us to focus on this, this word calling this morning, the first of our seven words. And the calling, it's important to know right up front that the calling that Paul is referring to here in Romans 8.30 is not calling to a particular vocation or job. So for example, I can say, I'm called to be a pastor or Martin DeLunga and Petro are called to be missionaries. Uh, you're called to be an engineer or an accountant or a doctor or a homemaker. That's your calling, your vocation. That's not what this calling is about. So put that out of your mind because that's not what this calling is about. The kind of calling in view here is a summons, a call from God, the king of the universe, to sinners to come home to him. That's what this calling is about, essentially. It's a calling from the king of the universe to sinners to come home to him. Now, I want us to look at four things about this calling. Number one, and it's right here in the text in front of us, calling is an act of God. Calling is an act of God. When Paul says in verse 30, those he predestined, he also called. And those he called. He also justified. So the calling we're talking about here is not me calling out to you. It's not me calling for volunteers to uh, do the garden at the church. It's God calling. God the Father calling. It's a summons, as I said, to the King of the universe, from the King of the universe to sinners to come home to Him. It is an act of God. So just that up front, so we know where we are. So. Number one, calling is an act of God. And then number two, calling is effective. In verse 30, look at the text. Paul says, those he called, he also justified. Those he called, he also justified. Justified is one of the words we're going to look at uh, down the line a few weeks. And it's a, it's a wonderful word. Uh, I'm not going to get into explaining it here. That's why it's important that in this series we go through every one, that you don't miss one, because if you miss one, it'll be like a missing link in the chain. So uh, even if you can't make it to church on a given Sunday, be sure that you, that, that you listen uh, online or listen to the podcast, because these things, these like, like links in a the chain, they're linked together. So we, we're not going to get into what justification is now, but the point here is that those he called, he also justified. All who are called are justified. Not just some, not most, but all who are called by God are justified. Now, at this point, it would be logical, and you might be asking, if you're thinking you probably are, you might be asking, what about those who hear the call of the gospel and reject it? How can you say that the call 
is effective if it doesn't result in justification, if it doesn't result in salvation, if people don't respond to it, if they reject it or refuse to heed it. That's a good question. And that's answered for us very helpfully in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So just move on in your Bible from Romans into the next book, uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, we're going to break in at verse, at verse 22, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 22. And here Paul writes, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Verse 24, but to those whom God has called both Jews and Gentiles, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Now what we have here is two kinds of calling in these verses. In verse 23, Paul says, we preach Christ. And he's writing to the church in Corinth. And you remember, uh, Paul went to Corinth after he'd been up in the north of Greece in Thessalonica. We did Thessalonians uh, uh, earlier this year. He was up in Thessalonica or Philippi, then Thessalonica, then Berea, and then he came down to Athens. And while he was in Athens, God told him to go to Corinth. And Corinth was a big city. Corinth was a rich city. Corinth was, a, a, was an international, a cosmopolitan city. Corinth was a wicked city. It was a promiscuous, godless city. And God said to Paul, I want you to go to Corinth. And this is what God said to, to Paul. I have many people in that city. I have many people in that city. What did God mean? God meant that there were people in Corinth who were currently living, wicked, sinful, godless, empty, unfulfilled, hopeless, lonely lives that God in his grace had in eternity foreknown and predestined to be called and justified and glorified. And so he sends Paul to Corinth. And in Corinth there was a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Greeks. Jews were there doing business as they were all over the Mediterranean world. The Greeks were there because that was their home. There were all sorts of other people there. And Paul went there and he preached the gospel. He shared the gospel. Sometimes one-to-one, -one, sometimes in groups. But he just... And Gentiles were Greeks. Some of those Jews who heard his message, oh, Paul, give us a break. This is Jesus' business. Get, do, do, do a miracle to prove that what you're saying is true. The Jews looked for signs. The Greeks, they were the philosophers of the age. They, they were looking for wisdom, and they were saying, they would say, oh, come on, Paul, give us a break. That, that doesn't make sense. Explain it to us. Prove it to us. Where do, we, where do we find this? What other philosopher believes this? But notice what happens. The good news is that in that group that Paul spoke to, there were those who identified as those whom God has called. Look at verse 24 again. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. it 
written word among the Jews and Gentiles who were hearing Paul's message, who were hearing the gospel, there was a group glory people. What made the difference? Paul answers the question in verse 24. They were called. They were called. But to those, he says, look at verse 24, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, from among both groups, they came to see Christ as the power of God and the wisdom of God. So in other words, when the, whenever the gospel is shared, there is a general call that goes out to everybody. Paul went to Corinth, and it wasn't as if God had put a mark on the forehead of every person that he had chosen. Paul, Paul had no clue. He just went and he just preached the gospel to everybody. But there were those in that everybody who heard the gospel differently, who heard the, the call of God in the message of God. John Piper calls this the call within the call. I like that. The call within the call. And think of, think of your family. There may be those in your family who've heard the same message that you've heard, but it has meant nothing to them. They've, they've rejected it. Perhaps they've even ridiculed it. But it's come to mean everything to you. Why? Because of this call of God. Let's just unpack that a little bit more. Jesus illustrated, and I love this. this. This is one of the most exciting things. Jesus illustrated this kind of call when he stood before the tomb of Lazarus. You remember, Lazarus had been dead for four days. Um, the process of decomposition had already begun in his body. Uh, when Jesus suggested that they open the tomb, you remember what Martha, Lazarus's older sister, said. Uh, I love the old King James. Many of us were raised on the old King James version. And uh, Martha said, she sort of protested, don't open the tomb. He's been in there four days. He stinketh. <laughs> and he did stinketh. I mean, he was, he, he was starting to reek. And uh, the, the, in obedience to the words of Jesus, they opened the tomb and Jesus, listen to the text, John 11, 43 and 44, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Now it's pointless to command a dead person to come out of the grave. I don't know if you've ever tried it. But if you have, I, it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. I've been with some grief-stricken families who literally wanted to do that. Wake up! Wake up in the midst of their grief. Wake up! I don't want you to be dead. But I've never seen a person wake up. Never seen a dead person come to life. It's pointless. But it's not pointless if the call contains the power to give life to the dead. And Jesus' call as the Son of God had the power to create what it commanded and to the utter astonishment of everybody. Oh, Lazarus comes wobbling out of the tomb, all wrapped up in the grave clothes. I mean, it must have been a sight to behold. In the same way, the call of God not only commands belief, but it creates belief 
in him. Coming back, just go back with me again to Romans 8.30. We'll camp there for just a bit longer. Romans 8.30, go back there. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Notice in verse 30 that everyone who is called is justified. And what does that imply about the effectiveness of the call? It implies, implies that the call is effective, just as the call of Jesus to Lazarus to come out of the grave was effective because he came out of the grave. But it also implies that the call creates saving faith. It gives, it enables saving faith because we're told again and again in Paul's writings and we'll come to it that people are justified by faith. Romans 5.1 Therefore since we have been justified by faith. Romans 3.28 A person is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So all the way through justification is by faith. So if, God, if Christ calls a person to himself and the person is justified, we have to assume that the call enables and creates the faith which leads to justification. Are you with me? I told you you'd have to think. But this is such, such exciting stuff. Probably better known territory is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Many of you will have that memorized. One of the greatest passages in the Bible is Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. It's one of those passages you've got to memorize. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you've probably got memorized. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this, this faith, not of yourselves, is the gift of God not by works so that no one can boast. And it is the call of God that creates and enables faith which leads to justification, not by works so that no one can boast. John, listen to this from John Piper. This omnipotent and astonishing work of God's saving providence is so central to becoming a Christian that the early Christians virtually made the called another name for what it means to be a Christian. They would refer to the Christians as the called ones, the called ones, the called out ones. That's what the church is, the ecclesia, those who have been called out. And how have we been called out? By this call, by this call. Speaking through the human proclamation of the gospel, that's what Paul was doing in Corinth, speaking through the human proclamation of the gospel in which he summons people to himself in such a way that they respond in saving faith. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 2 that because of sin, we are spiritually dead by nature. We are incapable of saving ourselves. We are incapable of repentance and faith apart from God's grace and power through his call. Now, as, as we study the scriptures, the, the circumstances of the call of God vary very widely. We think of, of, of Jesus calling the disciples to follow him. I mean, I often marvel as I read those, and I just read, I've been just finished, uh, just still reading Luke, but read in the early part of Luke, you have the call of the disciples, 
and uh, Jesus walks along and the, the shore of Galilee and they're fishing and they're mending their nets and they've got their little, they've got their business going and they're team of mates there and Jesus comes and he, he starts engaging them I mean we're given the high level picture in the gospel but I'm sure there was lots of conversation and then he, he says to them follow me and I will make you fishers of men and they give up their business they say goodbye to their family and they follow him I mean what's that all about and then he comes to Matthew the tax collector the rich oak not very respected oak and he Matthew's there at his at his little toll booth and uh, Jesus engages him in conversation and says Matthew follow me and he does I mean you can't explain that apart from this power of the call of Christ and uh, he established contact with those disciples and engaged with them and presented his claims uh, then there's the dramatic occasion which sometimes still happens of uh, Saul on the road to Damascus where, where it's this uh, as we say a, a Damascus road experience sometimes the call is is dramatic and instant and powerful and you say wow that kind of flipped overnight but then there's Lydia in Acts chapter 16 and Paul's down by the river at a prayer meeting and Lydia's kind of a on the fence Jewish proselyte Gentile businesswoman and uh, Paul is and Paul and Silas sharing the gospel talking about talking about Jesus and then it says there the Lord opened her heart to respond to the message so there's this quite he, that's the call of God the Lord over the Lord did it doesn't say she opened her heart the Lord opened her heart to respond to the message. I love the, the story of, of, of the conversion of John Wesley. You've no doubt heard about it. John Wesley was an Anglican missionary, Anglican minister who became a missionary to the colonies in, in North America. And he went across the Atlantic in a sailboat as a missionary and uh, just was totally useless. He didn't know why he was there. He was came back to England and he found himself in a little prayer meeting in Aldersgate Street in London. And the, the leader of the prayer meeting, or little small group as I guess we call it now, was reading from the preface to Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians. I mean, how boring is that? No <laughs> one and while he, while he, was, he was reading this preface to a commentary on Galatians, God called this Anglican minister who up until then had been unconverted. He called him. And John Wesley later said, my heart was strangely warmed. That's a very British way of saying it. My heart was strangely warmed. What happened? God called him to himself and he became the founder and father of the whole Methodist movement that changed Britain and saved Britain from a catastrophe worse than the French Revolution. My heart was strangely warmed. His brother Charles Wesley was the greatest Methodist hymn writer and in his, in his hymn, Oh for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, one verse goes like this. He speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The broken, humble hearts rejoice. The humble poor believe. One of the hymns that we used to sing, and I'm sure you sung it at Ferndale, the hymn I Know whom I have believed. You know that one? I know not why. God's wondrous grace. One of the verses goes like this. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the word, creating faith in him. <laughs> 
but I know whom I have believed. Don't understand it all. It's a lot of mystery involved, but it's that faith is created by the call of God. So the call of God is effective. Calling is effective. And then number three, just quickly, calling is life transforming. Calling is life transforming. And this is seen in a number of places in the New Testament where calling is spoken of more fully. Uh, when God calls his people, Peter says he calls them out of darkness into his wonderful light. He's, he calls us into his kingdom and glory. People are being called by God, are called to belong to Christ. We're called to be his holy people we're called to peace and to freedom and to hope and to holiness and to patient endurance and to eternal life. So we're called by God and that calling is to something. It's life, it leads to life transformation. Another wonderful hymn, I remember singing as a young person, a hymn by the, the great... Scottish hymn writer John Horatius Bonar uh, and it's the hymn I heard the voice of Jesus say and I can remember as a, as a teenager in our little Baptist church in Durban North we would sing this hymn and we had wonderful voices all the range of voices from deep deep basses all the way to the top and the uh, brilliant pianist and organist and a church with fabulous acoustics it just it never had a microphone it was just wooden floors and wooden pews and ne never been in a place where I heard singing anything like that we used to sing this hymn of Horatius Bonar and we would start out softly and then it would just build up on each verse listen to these words I heard the voice we're talking about calling I heard the voice of Jesus say Come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down your head upon my breast. And then it builds up. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. And in the second verse, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water, thirsty one. Stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in him. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise and all thy days be bright. I looked to Jesus. I looked to Jesus and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life I'll walk till traveling days are done. See, the call of God is life transforming. It changes everything. Absolutely everything. And it's his doing. That's why you meet people and you say, what, what's happened to you? You've changed. You're not like you used to be. Sometimes the change is dramatic. Sometimes it's more gradual, but it's always there because the call of God leads to life change. And if you prayed a prayer and made a decision and signed a card or did something and you haven't changed, well, what happened to you was not conversion. Whatever it was, it wasn't conversion unless you change. Because the call of God produces lasting life change. And that's why, that's partly why I want to, want to preach this series. Is because the Bible tells us that in every church, there will be people who think they're saved but who are not. And you've heard some, been given some false promise that if you prayed a particular prayer and uh, then bingo, shake my hand, you're a Christian. That is true if you change. 
Because if it's real, it will lead to lasting life change. Not, not problems, not that there won't be problems, not that there won't be ups and downs, not that there won't be slips and falls and need to repent, but your, your life will change. I mean, Lazarus didn't come half alive, he came alive. If anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So, it's possible that in any local church, there are people who think they're Christians, who may have become members, who may have been baptized, but are not really Christians. And so that's why we need to get out of the cabin and explore these words for our own good, for the sake of our own souls. Now, one last word is this. Number four, the call of God is life transforming. And number four, God calls sinners to himself through the gospel. God calls sinners to himself through the gospel. Now, why don't you go to 2 Thessalonians? You know your way to 1 Thessalonians. We've been there a lot earlier this year. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, we're just going to park here for a couple of minutes. We've seen that calling is an act of God, that calling is effective. The calling leads to life transformation. And now God calls sinners to himself through the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2 from verse 13. Paul says, But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work, the setting apart, the calling out work of the Holy Spirit. That's what we've been talking about. This is just another way of saying the same thing. God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and through belief in the truth, which is what you've, you've, you've got to do in response to the call of God. We'll get to, to that in the next weeks. He called you to this, to this salvation. He called you, he called you, there's that call again, he called you to this salvation. How? Through our gospel. Through our gospel. He called you through our gospel so that you might share in the glory of the Lord Jesus. One of the, one of the problems that all of us have as Believers who know we should be sharing our faith with others is fear, isn't that right? We're just af afraid of doing it, afraid of talking to our family, our friends, our work colleagues, our neighbors, people we run with or gym with. We're afraid of talking about the gospel because. We don't know how they're going to respond. We don't know if they're going to reject it or ridicule us or uh, if it's going to make any difference. And so th that's one of our biggest challenges, isn't it? I mean, even behind your masks, I can see that you're agreeing with me. It's one of my biggest challenges. But what helps enormously is realizing that I don't have to save anybody. I don't have to be so clever that I have to be able to convince people. In fact, if Minnie had read on into chapter 2, which I didn't ask her to do, but if, if I'd asked you to read on into chapter 2, where Paul talks about going to Corinth and preaching the gospel to Jews and Gentiles, and the Jews thought it was foolishness, or the Jews thought it went to sign, and the Gentiles thought it was foolishness, he goes on in the next chapter, and he says, when I came to you, when I came to Corinth, he was scared spitless. I mean, that's not in the text, but that's sort of what he says. He, he, he was bung. He says, when I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence or impressive speech. 
My, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. He says, I came to you with trembling and fear. And that's how we feel. But it doesn't matter. Because the power doesn't lie in me. The power lies in God. But God has chosen to use the message of the gospel. He called you Corinthians. He called you to this salvation through our gospel so that you might share in the glory of the Lord Jesus. And so that kind of takes the pressure off, doesn't it? I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to not be scared. I don't have to be wise enough to, to, to answer the tough questions of the people who are scientists and philosophers and who have all the answers to everything. I don't, that, 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 that's not what it, Paul didn't have that. He says, I went in fear and trembling and my speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Why? So that your faith would not rest on man's wisdom but on God's power. Because faith that rests on man, if I convince somebody because I'm smarter than them intellectually and I back them into a corner and they say, yes, Jesus must be Lord. I've accomplished nothing. Their life's not going to change. The only thing that will change their lives is the power of God coming through the call of God. And I just become the channel that conveys that message and somehow in God's strange providence, the Holy Spirit, if you like, and I say this reverently, he rides on that message into their lives and he does the calling. They don't just, they, they don't just hear my voice, they start hearing God's voice. And he speaks and listening to his voice, the humble poor belief. That's the wonder of this thing. I needed some new tires on my car the other day. And so I went to Tiger Wheel and Tire down in Northcliffe. And uh, I sat and read my book in the freezing cold waiting room while they changed the tires. And at last, when I was frigid and rigid and just about dead, they came and said, uh, so your car's ready. So I walked out into the sunlight, into the warmth, and there was my car with a new set of tires, and there were three guys around, uh, one that I'd engaged with earlier, and as I took my keys and thanked them, I pulled out my little uh, I had money for him. A mirror. You know what I saw? Three guys, three men standing in the forecourt of Tiger Wheel and Tire, all reading the book. And as I drove away, I said, Lord, That's your message. Won't you call one of them to you through the message? Could it be that that little message could change their life? Absolutely, because it's the gospel. All I had to do was be, be polite and say, uh, here's a little book, won't you read it? And I'm done. I'm, no, I can pray, but that's, that's it. I'm done. And it's going to be fun in heaven. Now, Irene and I often talk about this because we give out booklets all the time to all sorts of different people, uh, she more than me. And uh, sometimes I say, it's going to be fun in heaven. Maybe have somebody come up and uh, say, hey, you know, remember, you gave me that booklet. It happened to Irene at Cresta. She gave out a booklet to a university student from UJ who was employed just before Christmas to be polite and show the visitors to Cresta uh, where, to, where to go and what to do and just be helping them with their bags and their trolleys and whatnot. She gave him a booklet. A year later, a year later, we're back at Cresta at Christmas and the same guy comes running up to us and he, and he recognizes me and he says, oh, I've been coming to Rosebank Union. <laughs> 
And then I went to BBC and I came to know Christ and I've been baptized. I mean, that was one incident. Man, heaven's going to be fun. And the people you spoke to, the people at work where you just dropped a little bit of the gospel in fear and trembling and you thought, I bet I made a fool of myself. You'll probably never talk to me again. I might get fired, you know. And it's not up to us. He called you to this through our gospel so that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Oh God, our Father, we thank you for your great grace in calling sinners who are dead in trespasses and sins in giving new life where there is spiritual death, in giving faith where there is unbelief. And oh Lord, we, we thank you for this miracle of the call of God that creates what it demands, that gives repentance and faith and leads to life change. Oh Lord, I pray this morning for any who have listening to your word who are not yet yours. Maybe they think they are, but maybe they are not yet. And we I pray that they would hear your call where there is a gentle whisper that is irresistible or as a thunderclap that is equally irresistible that you would grant them faith and repentance, that they would be justified by faith and have peace with you. And Lord, I pray for those of us who are, by your grace, numbered among the called. Thank you that this message is our gospel. And thank you that you will call others to yourself through our gospel. Help us to be faithful in doing that. Always remembering that the power doesn't lie in us. It's not up to our cleverness. But you have chosen through the foolishness of what is preached to save those who believe. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.